All right. Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream and verse by verse study through Second Thessalonians. Uh, today we are taking and tackling just one verse, verse three of Second Thessalonians chapter two. I'll invite you if you're watching online, if you're here uh, in the church and you're not there already, I'll ask you to turn to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. And if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. If not, that's all right. You can follow along as I read. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I think you'll see why here in a moment. But I'm going to actually read this verse from the 1599 Geneva Bible. Okay. Yeah, cool. How cool is that, right? You got to love Bible software. So this is pre-1611 King James. This is 1599 Geneva Bible, and it reads as follows. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, speaking of the tribulation, that day shall not come except there come a departing first, and that man of sin, the Antichrist, be disclosed, even the son of perdition. Let's pray, if you would join with me. Lord, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for this verse here in your word, Lord. And I just pray that you'll Give me clarity of speech, humility of heart, and uh, Lord, speak. Your servants are listening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to begin by thanking you for your patience with me concerning my understanding of the interpretation of this verse. As many of you know, I've gone back and forth over the years. But in 2017, I settled it as it relates to the interpretation of this verse being about the rapture. And as such, I can stand before you today, and I can say with great certainty that Paul is referring to the rapture coming first here in verse 3. If you'll kindly indulge me, I'll explain how I get there. And at the conclusion, I'll also explain why this matters now more than it ever has for us as Christians living in this world that we are living in. I owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Andy Woods and his book titled The Falling Away, Spiritual Departure or Physical Rapture, a second look at 2 Thessalonians 2-3. In it, he provides 10 reasons why what many refer to as the falling away, the apostasy, is actually the rapture of the church. I would really encourage you to get your hands on a copy of this booklet. It's actually really a booklet, and uh, God has used it in my life, and it appears that I'm in pretty good company with many others as well. A number of weeks ago, Don Stewart, who we had the privilege of having speak here a number of years ago, was on Happening Now with Jack Hibbs, who we also had more recently. And they were asked this question regarding 2 Thessalonians 2-3, and Don Stewart brought up Dr. Andy Woods uh, and his book that I just referenced. And this is Don Stewart we're talking about. This is a, a guy who, when he teaches, he reads it literally out of the Greek as he's teaching. I mean, he's truly a, a scholar in every sense of the word. 
And he said, when asked the question, he said, before I read Andy's book, I was at about a, maybe a six, you know, on a scale of one to 10, that it was a reference to the rapture. But after reading Andy's book, uh, I'm at like a 9.8. And for somebody like Don Stewart to say that, I got to tell you, I was greatly encouraged. Also, Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum, who we also had the privilege of having uh, uh, speak here. This is a number of years ago at the old building. Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum, get this, revised the chapter of his book, very well-known book, The Footsteps of the Messiah, after reading Andy's book and reconsidering his own position of the falling away or the apostasy. So what follows are three reasons. There are many, but three reasons that sealed the deal for me in my quest to understand this game-changing passage. And when I say game-changing, that's not hyperbole. I mean, this, this changes everything. And again, I hope to expound more on that at the conclusion of our time. This is really a game changer. So here's the first reason. The context favors a physical departure interpretation of apostasia, which is the Greek word in the original language. In the context of both the subsequent verses and the prior verses, Paul is clearly speaking about the rapture and not the falling away. His first epistle, it's all about the rapture. It's all about the Lord's return. Paul did not mention anything about a falling away or a great apostasy to the Thessalonians. And keep in mind, this is very important. These were his first letters. These were his earliest letters. It was not until later in Paul's ministry, arguably until the end of his life, chiefly when he's writing to Timothy, that he talks about this last day's apostasy, but he never mentioned anything to the Thessalonians early on. It wouldn't be until many years later that he would start talking about a falling away, a spiritual departure from the faith. But that is not the context. Of this, Woods writes, while the three rules of real estate are location, 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 (laughs) The three rules of Bible interpretation are context, context, context. Context is king when determining the meanings of words. This is especially true since words frequently have multiple meanings. Take the word apple as an example. This is a great example. Think how many meanings can be generated from the single word apple. It can refer to a computer, a piece of fruit, the pupil of one's eye, and even New York City. So when you see the word apple in a paragraph, how do you know what the meaning is in play? The context answers that question. If the word apple is found in a context dealing with computers, it would be invalid to substitute a fruit understanding into the word apple. Clearly it is in the context of an apple computer. And so too is the word apostasia clearly in the context of the rapture of the church. Second reason. Early Bible translations favor the physical departure view. 
I have to say that this is perhaps one of the most compelling arguments such that the earliest Bible translations render the noun apostasy as departure. Wycliffe in the year 1384, Tyndale in the year 1526, Coverdale in the year 1535, Cranmer in the year 1539, Breaches in the year 1576, Biza in the year 1583, and then finally the Geneva Bible, both in 1599 and also in the year 1608. Well, that brings up a question, doesn't it? The question is, when is it that the translators change the noun apostasy from departure or departing to falling away in the later translations? For that answer, Woods cites Dr. Thomas Ice, who offers the following explanation. Listen to this. Most scholars say that no one knows the reason for the translation shift. However, a plausible theory has been put forth by Martin Butala in his Master of Theology thesis produced at Dallas Theological Seminary in 1998. It appears, get this, that the Catholic translation into English from Jerome's Latin Vulgate, known as the Reims Bible 1576, was the first to break the translation trend. Apostasia was revised from the departure to the Protestant revolt. Oh, that makes sense. No wonder. Oh, it gets better. Revolution is the terminology still in use today when Catholicism teaches the history of the Protestant Reformation. Under this guise, apostasia would refer to a departure of Protestants from the Catholic Church. Let me just insert parenthetically that the campaign now with a dying Catholic Church in these last days is come back home. Oh, by the way, I learned this many, many years ago, and I never knew this, and I'll never forget. It was on Valentine's Day, and I took my wife out to dinner. This is many years ago on the mainland. That's back when you could actually go out to dinner. But anyway, we, we were sitting there, and the server said, hey, what are you guys, you know, doing for Valentine's Day, uh, you know, and anything special after dinner? I said, we're actually going to our prayer meeting at our church. He goes, oh, you are? I said, yeah. He goes, you must be Catholic. I'm like, I'm looking for my crucifix. You know how they always keep Jesus on the cross? And I didn't have any rosary beads or anything. I'm like, what in the world? Well, he says, oh, uh, uh, Catholic means universal. <laughs> oh, it does? Yeah. So right now, Catholicism is like, come back home to the mother church the universal church, because there was this departure, this, this apostasia during the Protestant Reformation. I'm sorry I'm saying it like that, <laughs> but I mean, I, I feel duped. Okay, I feel better now. Let me just continue the quote. The Catholic translators appear eager to engage in polemics against the Reformation by even allowing it to impact Bible translation. Thus, 
the shift from a physical to a spiritual understanding of apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, in the Roman Catholic Reims Bible English translation, appears to have been theologically rather than exegetically motivated. (sighs) That right there settles it for me. But I got one more reason. And it's that 2 Thessalonians 2-3 is part of a review course. Now stay with me on this. I have to confess that this was the biggest obstacle to my understanding of this verse being the rapture and not a spiritual departure or apostasy or falling away from the faith. And it was really this argument of if it was the rapture, why wouldn't Paul use the Greek word harpazo like he did in his first epistle? In chapter 4, verse 17, when he says, we who are alive, the trumpet's going to sound, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up, English, harpazo, Greek, rapturous, Latin, which is transliterated rapture. Why? Paul could have saved us a lot of problems if he would have just but used the word harpazo in verse 3. Why didn't he? Answer, (laughs) because he's writing a second letter to clarify and review everything that he had taught them when he was with them. And he's also now writing this second letter about a year after the first letter, because there was a forged letter that was circulating after he left. And it was as if from Paul, and it was confusing them, it was scaring them, and it was messing them up, and they thought they missed the rapture, and they thought they were already in the tribulation. And they're like, oh my goodness, what about our loved ones that have died? What about them? And that's why Paul says, no, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who died in Christ. Let no man deceive you. By the way, can I, what are you going to say? No, of course I can. I, I, I need to say this at this juncture. Replete throughout Scripture, particularly in the Gospels from the Savior Himself, and then also as echoed by the Apostle Paul, there's this common theme of do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Let no man deceive you. Do you get the impression that there was deception? That this would be an issue? How about that famous, very well-known Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. Oh my goodness, pastors love to preach out of Matthew 24. When the disciples asked Jesus, what are going to be the signs of your return and the end of the age? And Jesus says, let no man deceive you. Don't, the first thing He says, is don't be deceived. There's going to be a a lot of false Christ coming in my name. Don't be deceived. And then he goes on and lists things like famines and pestilences and and earthquakes. And oh, by the way, we talked about this on Thursday night, uh, Pastor Mack and I, that uh, he says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In the original language of the Greek New Testament, that word for uh, nation is ethnos, where we get our English word for ethnic. In other words, ethnicity will rise up against ethnicity. And the, <laughs> these, will be the, these will be the beginning of birth pains meaning that they will come with greater frequency and in greater intensity. So don't be deceived. (laughs) He's clearing it up. 
And then when he gets to verse 5, which we will get to, Lord willing, next week, we're in no hurry, in case you didn't notice, going through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I, I hope you know why. I've shared it in the past. I'll share it again. I hope you don't tire of me saying it. But if you were to put a caption on a picture of what is happening in the world today, you could sum it up with 2 Thessalonians 2. You know what is in this chapter? You know what we're going to be talking about after verse 3? We're going to be talking about the Antichrist being revealed after the church is removed. And he's this man of lawlessness, and the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And God says He Himself will send this powerful delusion, deception. And it will be so strong that people will believe the lie. Why? Because they rejected the truth. Oh my goodness. This is an apt description of exactly where we are at today in this world. You know what's going to happen next? The rapture. I was asked after first service, uh, after the update, uh, Pastor J.D., uh, you, you make it sound like it's really close. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. <laughs> should I, should I, Actually, this is, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is why this matters. This is why this matters, because if this is the rapture, and it is, do you realize if the Antichrist cannot be revealed, the, the lawlessness that we already see at work, and, and the rapture comes first, then, verse 3, the Antichrist is revealed. And we're already seeing lawlessness at work. That means the rapture is like really close. I think about what Jesus said. He, he said, behold, I come in an hour you expect not. It's sooner than any of us could possibly imagine. Anyway, where was I? I was somewhere here. It was a deeply profound point I was making, I'm sure. Oh, verse 5. Verse 5, yeah. <laughs> when we get to verse 5. Paul says this, don't you remember I told you this when I was with you? Wait, wh where did you tell us? Where did you write us? Don't you remember? No, I told you. Okay, let, let's go over it again. I, I picture the Apostle Paul with his eraser and his chalkboard. I don't think they had chalkboards back, but, but let's just say they did. He takes his eraser, and he erases the chalkboard, and he says, okay, let, let's start from scratch. Let's review the material. Don't, you, you, you don't remember? Okay, let's review everything. And that's what this is. Listen to, again, what Wood says. He says it best this way. What Paul is doing in 2 Thessalonians 2, is he is reviewing ground that he has already covered. When you review prior ground, you do not lay the fundamentals down all over again, do you? You do not use the identical vocabulary that you used previously. I am a teacher in a college. And when I review for the test, I do not reteach all the material covered earlier in the semester. I use different words. What Paul is doing here is a review course, and that is why he does not use the identical language that he used to describe the rapture in 1 Thessalonians. It is also worth noting, listen very carefully, this is very important, this is what settled it for me, that the mere absence of the word harpazo should not, in and of itself, disqualify a passage like 2 Thessalonians 2-3 from being a rapture passage, since many commonly accepted rapture passages, John 14, 1-3, 
This was a biggie for me. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, where Paul says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's in the nursery of every church. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all <laughs> be changed. In the a metamorphosis, in the twinkling of an eye, we put off corruptible, the old bodies. I can't wait. And we put on our new glorified bodies. That's the rapture. He doesn't use the word harpazo. Titus 2.13, <laughs> our blessed hope also fail to employ the term harpazo. Moreover, many would also consider the catching up of the two witnesses during the tribulation period as a type of a rapture, Revelation eleven twelve. even though the verb harpazo is not employed here either. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you, Pastor, for that dissertation. <laughs> um, here's the question. Why does this even matter? Why are you getting so excited and so worked up? I'm glad you asked. You asked, right? I'm going to answer anyway. I mean, come on, with all due respect, the interpretation of 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is not a matter of salvation. Yeah, you're right. I concur. But may I kindly suggest that while it may not be a matter of salvation, it can certainly be a matter of sanctification, and I'll explain why. If this is the rapture, and I believe it absolutely is, then doesn't that sort of change the complexion of everything? Wouldn't it stand a reason that it would have a profound impact on how we live our lives? Bear with me. Let's just say, for purpose of discussion, that, you know, I, I, I can't sign off on this. I still think it's a, you know, falling away. It's a apostasy. It's a spiritual departing from the faith. Okay, fine. Let, let's just, let's, let's, let's talk about that, okay? All right. Um, okay, so the tribulation can't begin, can't happen until the, not a, the, which is another reason, by the way, the falling away comes first. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. There's always been apostasy and falling away and a departure from the faith throughout the church age. And, and by the way, uh, how, that, that's so ambiguous. How are you going to, that's like, how do they say it, you know, nailing jello to the wall? Oh, sorry for the, if you have a better one, let me know afterwards, I'll start using it. But how do you get your hands on that and and that, that, that doesn't make any sense, because then Paul, in the context of the rapture, is saying, oh, by the way, um, did we talk about this when I was there with you? And did I mention this in my first letter to you, that there's going to be this apostasy, this falling away? And do you remember? Did I, did I say it? Was that a different church? Maybe that was the Corinthians I told that to. Huh. Maybe it was the Ephesians. Maybe it wasn't the, th I don't know. I, I, I mean, you see where, I, where I'm going with this? It's so wishy-washy. I, 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 I used that term a couple weeks back during an update, and one of our online members, I love this so much, I, I, I made the comment, you cannot be wishy-washy about the rapture. 
And so the comment was, I'm not wishy-washy, I'm (laughs) watchy-watchy. I thought, perfect, that's exactly right. That's a t-shirt right there, or a hat, or something, or a bumper sticker. But how do you, I mean, he, and, and by the way, how does that make any sense that here Paul is trying to clarify what he told them when he was with them, and he wrote to them, why would he introduce this that he'd never mentioned to them, that would even further confuse them, wouldn't it? I mean, that would bring up a whole list of questions. Well, wait a minute, how are we going to know when the last Christian has fallen away? It's actually the opposite, by the way. So, okay, so it is the rapture. Now, reread the verse through the lens of this being the rapture. And what what does it say? It says the tribulation can't start until the rapture comes first, and then the Antichrist is revealed. And oh, by the way, spoiler alert, once the Antichrist is revealed, lawlessness, deception, lying signs and wonders. That is a description of the seven year tribulation. That's why it matters. Listen to what John said in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and What we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, notice, not comes, appears, that's the rapture, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And then He says this, all who have this hope in Him, purify themselves just as He is pure. In other words, when you know that the Lord could come at any time, that is going to have a profound impact on how you live your life. You get your affairs in order. He's coming. And don't don't think for a moment this is referring to any thing having to do with works. We're not saved by works. It's not a purifying ourselves. No, we are righteous in Christ. Christ's imputed righteousness, though our sins be as scarlet, Isaiah says, He makes them as white as snow. This is, in other words, (laughs) having this hope, you get your affairs in order. You get right with the Lord. You get serious about the things of God with this hope. Listen, I, I know in my own life, this anticipation of just how soon the Lord's return is for the rapture of the church, it affects everything I do, every decision I make in every arena of life. I want to share with you what someone said to me when I was just a new believer concerning the pre-trib rapture, which I have always believed. I've been walking with the Lord for 38 years. I was well taught from from the start, and I'm so thankful for that. So we're having this conversation, and I'm sharing with him about why I believe in a pre-trib rapture. And he says to me, he says, well, you know what? I'm pan-trib. I'm like, pan, what? I I asked him what pan-trib meant, and he said, oh, I just believe it's all going to pan out in the end. And then I was stuck with me, and I thought, oh, okay, you know, I'm young, I'm, you know. I share that because Maybe then, this is back in the 80s, don't do the math, I was five, so a long time ago. 
Maybe then. But today? I do not believe that the world in which we are living today is forgiving of such ambiguity. One need look no further than to the many Christians today who are sadly, unnecessarily riddled with confusion and filled with fear. I can't even begin to tell you how many questions we get, email, posted. Uh, has the sixth seal been open? Are we in the tribulation? No. It's like the Thessalonians then, there are many now that think we're already in the tribulation and the rapture doesn't come first. That's what I mean by we have to settle this. This has to be settled. You'll forgive the play on words, but I see pan-trip believers as synonymous with panicked believers. They're uninformed at best and deceived at worst. And this is why it is so important. I would even argue it is of paramount importance to be settled and sound and solid when it comes to the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. doctrine. It should be noted that panic, you know where the word panic comes from? Those of you that go to Israel with us, you know, we go to this place called Caesarea Philippi. Very, very interesting place. Very evil place. In fact, it's where the gates of hell are. And it's where this false god was feared and worshipped. You know what that god's name was? God, by the way, with a little g. <laughs> you know what that god's name was? Pan, where we get panic, fear. And it's there that Jesus in Matthew 16 tells His disciples that the gates of hell would not overcome His church. Let me say lastly, that I am personally so very glad that I am sound doctrinally concerning the pre-tribulation rapture. Let me say the same thing in a different way. I cannot even imagine not having this settled, being unsure, unsettled. What if? Because at a time like this, with everything that's happening in the world. No wonder Christians are so full of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear. No wonder Christians are so confused. Satan is the author of confusion. Of course he wants to do that. I mean, I know the rapture has to happen before the seven year tribulation. Not only is that a game changer, that's a life changer. Because no matter what happens, and it's happening, it's getting real, isn't it? Would you agree? It's, it, hey, I was thinking about this. I just, I want you to, uh, this isn't very perky, but um, I was thinking about this. So what's next? No, right? Hey, by the way, last night, Atlanta, Georgia, did you see this? They burned down a Wendy's, take over the streets, rioting, lawlessness. Another white man, uh, pardon me, black man killed by a white police officer. We don't know the facts, but oh my God, are you kidding me? What's, what's the next thing? 
I mean, we, we know, at least I, I hope you know, that there's an agenda. We talked about this in the update today. The agenda to destroy this controlled demolition of the current world order in order to usher in this reset and new world order. So I'll close this way. I am totally at peace. I have no fear. Even if it gets worse before the rapture, and it could, it could. I still have the blessed hope of the rapture. Even if things get worse before the rapture, because I know that it will absolutely happen before all hell literally breaks loose. That's why this needs to be settled. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I thank you so much for your word and I thank you for this verse and the understanding of it. The rightly dividing of your word of truth can just change everything. And such is the case, I believe, here. Lord, I pray for any here today or watching online that are maybe just really struggling and even fearful. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage and strengthen their hearts, that they would be anchored and settled in the blessed hope, that they would settle it, that you're coming soon, very soon, sooner than any of us could possibly imagine. Everything that you told us would happen, at the time of the end is happening. It's happening. So Lord, thank you. It's not that we're giving up. It's that we're looking up. Because we know our redemption draws nigh. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Maranatha. In Jesus' name. Amen.